What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. In today's video, I'm going to be building an awesome 4K gaming PC build inside of one of the most unique PC cases I've ever ever seen. This is a system that's just going to smash through all the latest AAA titles, deliver amazing gaming performance, and look absolutely stunning once it's been put together. As always, I'm going to walk you through all the parts I chose for this build and why, including some potential alternatives to consider, having a bit of fun getting this thing assembled, and then looking at detailed benchmarks in some of the biggest titles a little later on. So without any further ado, let's dive right into it. The Gigabyte Aorus Master 16 is here with a 240Hz 2560 by 1600 display up to an RTX 5090 laptop GPU with a staggering 24 gigs of VRAM and Max-Q technology. The choice of CPU spans up to a Core Ultra 9 275HX2 with a turbo of up to 5.4 gigahertz and 24 cores for maximum power. What's more, there's also up to 64 gigs of RAM and room for a Gen 5 NVMe drive for the ultimate in storage speeds. Learn more at the first link in the description below. Now I'm going to start today's build by talking about the case because I'm really excited to build inside of the chassis I've picked up for today's video. The case I'm talking about specifically is this, the Thermaltake View 390 Air. Now Thermaltake are one of those brands right now that feel like they're on the up and some of the cases and stuff I've used from them recently I've been really impressed by, including their recent view, I want to say it was the 370, 380 in our last build, which looked amazing. You you can find that in the cards. Now, this takes things a step further because it takes the curved glass that is just so popular right now and actually puts it on the side up to the top rather than on the side to the front. Now, the advantage of that is that we keep all of the mesh ventilation at the front of the case to actually aid in terms of the airflow, but we still get a panoramic view of the components used inside the chassis. And I think it just removes nice and easily a little something like so. Look at that for a piece of glass pretty impressive, right? It always kind of blows my mind that they can curve that and not smash it. Inside the case, you get a few cool party tricks. You get this nice GPU support bracket, which actually provides a huge range of adjustment. We've got huge amount of support at the front for large fans. Again, further in for intake fans on the side. Here where you can see we've got the motherboard tray. We have room for these BTF reverse connect motherboards. At the back of the case, we've got two 120 mil fans. I'm going to swap these out. I think they're kind of ugly in black, but we're going to deal with that. And then at the top here, you actually get room to add a screen. And I believe I have the right screen for the job. This is Thermaltake's 6 inch LCD screen, which is pretty cool. And that's gonna go up here at the very top of the case a bit later and show useful information or at least that's the plan. The real test with this case is gonna be what it's like to build in. So in order to do that, I should probably talk you through some of the other components I've picked for today's system. And let's start off with this, the CPU. Now this right here is the AMD Ryzen 5. No, it's not. Now this right here is the AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D. And it's a chip that frankly requires little explanation. It's got eight cores, 16 threads, a boatload of L3 cache, and is consistently basically the fastest desktop gaming CPU on the market. If all you really want to do is game. Of course, if you want better multi-thread performance, you definitely want to look at the 9950X 3D and the 9900X 3D. They give you the same gaming upside as this chip, but with a lot higher cost and in exchange, a higher core count too. For the graphics card, I'm going to be going for the RTX 5080 today. To be honest, there wasn't really much dilemma or debate about what I was going to use. And the reason behind that is frankly because AMD just don't really have anything to compete at this level. And the kind of money you'll pay for an RTX 5090 just doesn't feel worth it in this build. I don't think the performance uplift is actually that handy for the vast majority of people. This is still an expensive GPU, although graphics card prices have been falling rapidly over the last few weeks. I made a video talking all about it with all the data you might want to hear, and you can check that out in the cards section now. This is awesome at 1440p, but primarily 4K. Any game, ray tracing, DLSS, turn it on, turn it off, it doesn't matter. It's fine either way, and it's going to smash through with some amazing frame rates, which is exactly what you want for a high-end build like this. Talking of high-end components, I've picked up this SSD from Samsung, the 9100 Pro. I've used this in a few builds and the reason being is because it's kind of the benchmark for high-end SSDs. It's got two terabytes of capacity, which I think is fine. In terms of memory, a Thermaltake kit actually to match some of the other parts today. This is their Tough Ram XGRG 
RGB. I've used this kit in a few different builds before, though this pack is brand new. And I have to say, I actually think it's one of my favorite looking RAM kits on the market right now. The design on it is like really, really polished and clean. And I think it just makes a lot of sense really for the design I'm going for today. I'd say in terms of like my favorite looking RAM kits, I'm a big fan of the Trident Neo from G-Skill. That's a great alternative if you want something that's a little more kind of mainstream, I guess, or a little easier to get your hands on. But this is really nice. I like the split pattern. I like this little kind of glossy bit in the middle. And of course we have a dressable RGB on the top. In terms of the motherboard, let's talk about this next. This right here is the ROG X870 gaming Wi-Fi. I figured Asus GPU, Asus motherboard kind of made sense. X870 is good because it gives us all the high end features. If you wanted to trim out cost, you could go B850. It's not going to be a big problem in today's build. But I fathomed we're building a high end PC. It's not quite the ultimate PC, but it's not that far off. And as such, a board like this with a few extra features, a bit more widespread USB 4, a bit more bandwidth, a bit more connectivity wasn't going to be a bad idea. As you can imagine, it's got a few cool quality of life features too. Things like your tallest NVMEs here. That's pretty clever if I can get it back in. See, look how easy that was to use. We've got plenty of USB headers. We've got two USB 3 headers and our Type-C header. You've got the Q code LED display. So any debugging and stuff is a bit easier. And then on the rear IO at the back, you've got loads and loads of connectivity, including of course your high speed ethernet. Nice to have an optical audio port and then a plethora of fast USB type A and type C connections. So really this is all we're going to need. The only things I haven't talked about yet are the power supply and the CPU cooler. I'll come back to the PSU later because to be honest, it's slightly less exciting compared to some of the other bits. The cooler on the other hand is pretty snazzy. This is the Magflow 360 Ultra. And it's actually got this really nice large square screen on, which I rather like. Every cooler now you seem to buy has a screen on. It makes sense. I don't know whether we're going to have a bit of duplication between this screen and the cooler screen. We'll have to figure that out later. But I guess there's only really one way to find out. And that is to start by getting this thing built. And as always, I'm going to kick off with CPU, RAM, and the SSD. I nearly forgot that. I've been at Gamescom last week. And now... Now my brain is still kind of warming up. Too many games were played. Oh, CPU is going to be first. I'm just going to lift up the CPU socket. Drop the processor into place gently give it a bit of a wiggle and then return the socket cover back down once that's done i'm going to move on to the memory next i'll be pulling back the clips on the second and fourth random slots for today's build and then sliding the tough ram into place get that nice satisfying click sound and you know that the memory is good to go the ssd is next up and to do this you do have to use a screwdriver to take out what looks like two heat sinks but they are actually combined into one unit thankfully the retention method is nice and easily toolless but then for a screwdriver to take the slot out is a little bit more hassle than you might imagine for a board of this price. Awesome, so the motherboard assembly is pretty much good to go. I'm next going to take a look inside the case at all the standoffs. Now in this particular chassis you can see that all of the standoffs are in the right locations for ATX motherboards. We will circle them on your screen, there's three at the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom. Now they actually match up perfectly with the screw hole locations on the motherboard itself and as long as these two match you're going to be a-okay. I'm then going to slide the motherboard into the case I believe the center standoff is raised, so that should hold the board in for us. Although, it's a bit of a tight squeeze with these rear fans. Yeah, now, I think I could probably force it in. However, the fans are going to be changed anyway, so maybe it just makes sense to take those out at this point. That's the thing, right, when you're PC building, a lot of it is just about what happens as you go and just kind of adapting to the fact that sometimes doing things in a slightly different order than normal can be helpful. Is that a little bit easier? Yes. Yes, it is. I think there's actually two standoffs that are slightly raised to hold the board in, which is nice. And as you can see, once you get one or two screws in, it starts to stabilize and makes installing the rest of the remaining nine screws that little bit easier. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I think the next thing I'm actually going to do is install some of those fans I just mentioned. I figured getting them in now is going to be a bit easier. Now, in terms of the fans that I've got, I've actually got these Tough Fan EX 120s. Now, these are Thermaltake's ARGB sync, which means they just plug in to the motherboard, which in my opinion is way better and is going to give us a lot of control in, as I say, applications like Signal. So for me, I'm going to put two fans in the back here and then three fans at the bottom too. Okay, fans are in. What about the power supply and all the front panel cables next? It feels 
was a little bit boring, but it'd be good to get it out of the way because then we can do the cooler and the GPU, which are a bit more exciting. And as you can see, our fans are into and looking good. This is the Tough Power GT. It's 1200 watts, which is about right for a 5080 and a 9800X 3D, arguably maybe 200 watts more than what you really need. And this unit is super small, really, really compact. Actually quite cool as well to see. We get two GPU power connectors. So you've got two slots there. Now you might be thinking, James, why would you want two? If you're doing like editing or rendering where a second card is helpful, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Most people, you're not going to use it, but I guess it's better to have it than to not have it. Now, in terms of the power cables that I'm going to need, I certainly won't be needing all of the ones that come included. I'll walk you through which ones it is, starting off with, why don't we start with the biggest one? Our motherboard power cable, so you can see it's split into two on one side and then 24 pins on the other. We've then got the GPU power cable, so this one is rated for up to 600 watts, which is the PCI Gen 5 limit. And then, yeah, we've got another second 600 watt unit. We're not going to need that, but as I say, you might want it. We're going to need some CPU power cables. So there's the first one and you can see there it actually splits into two and we should have a second one somewhere as well. No, no, no. Yes, there's the second one. So you can see there it's labeled CPU to make life nice and easy. And then finally, I'm going to pop in a SATA power connector too in case we need it for any of our like fan hubs or the CPU cooler screen. And then of course our remaining cables can be stored in the bag, safe and sound. And you want to keep hold of these in case you ever decide to either sell the PC, sell the power supply or swap out any of the components later on. Get all those power cables plumbed up to the rear of the power supply and then we're going to run them to the CPU in the top left of the motherboard, the motherboard on the right hand side and finish off with all the front panel cables, everything from our JFP1 and the HD audio to of course the USB type A and USB type C. Okay so we are getting somewhere. I'm going to do the CPU cooler next which is, where have I, where have I put it? Aha, here. As organized as ever here on the GeekerWatt channel. Let me start with the cooler by showing you the instruction manual. Now that might sound a little boring, but it's important to note how this is installed on AMD. So it uses this AMD style bracket, but to actually get it secured on, you do need to remove the screen before screwing the cooler down. And I do think I want to try and go for a push-pull config. Probably one thing I do need to check is GPU clearance. Now a quick hover of the card into the case should give me enough information to decide. Yeah, it's pretty big. Um, and I don't think the GPU support bracket fits. <laughs> Maybe we take the GPU support bracket out. It might be that that can go back in later. We'll have to see. So let's hover that in. Mm, I think it's marginal. I'm gonna put the GPU in. We've got these two PCI lanes just here. And then the graphics card goes in. Ah, wrong PCI lane. <laughs> this is going really well, isn't it? Oh man alive. Let's try that again. Let's get the tough card in. That's in, good stuff. Then in terms of the radiator, the bit that I need to try and figure out is if we can get the rad in here. Yes, we can. With a fan on the inside. Yes, we can. It's tight. There's not a lot of room, but there's enough for me. In terms of what fans are going to use, so you get these nice SWAT fans included as standard, which is great. And they give you the reverse blades as well. So if you have them in intake, you can swap those out. So I'm going to begin by adding the fans onto the inside of the radiator. So they're the ones that match. I'm then going to finish things off by sliding the radiator in, screwing through the SWAT fans from the front of the case using the the long included radiator screws to get the actual radiator portion nice and secure. All that I need to do to finish things off is remove the cover from the water block. That was pretty easy. Slide the AMD bracket into place. Add a dab of the included thermal paste onto our 9800X3D. That looks about right to me. And then the CPU water block itself, don't forget the peel, is going to live on top. Just get that secured one and get that secured two. You can hand tighten these to begin with, but to be honest with you, your best bet is to go in with a screwdriver and just try and get them both, if you can, equally taut. The screen module is then going to return back into place. Pretty easy, he says. There we go. I think we're on. And I do, of course, need to add this little screen at the top of the case as well. How do I get this out? Do you push it? Ah, so there's the smaller one, but that's not quite big enough for the screen I've got. So a couple of screws later, I'm hoping it's going to pop out. However, we've got a problem because these top screws seem like a massive design flaw. Let me go the old fashioned way with my phone and show you what I mean. Now these screws right here are the ones I've removed to actually loosen the bracket at the bottom, but the screws for the top are hidden up there and over there. The problem is this here is for the IO. Now it doesn't screw, but not very easily when the power supply is installed. I think that means I need to unscrew the power supply, then the IO shield cover. Thermal tape, that has 
got to be an easier way to do that. Plus this plastic could just have like pop pins and just pull straight out. It's not very heavy. It doesn't need a great deal of support. Ah, that's a bit frustrating. Anyway, the screen looks rather nice. So I am excited to get this working in the build today. And I'm gonna just chuck the screen at the front here. I actually think the size is really, really clever and it is gonna fill a lot of this dead space at the top. It's even more stupid because that basically just pops in. Now, yes, a screw or two is gonna help to secure it down, but we really didn't need to make it that complicated. The only thing that's then remaining is to see if the GPU support bracket will actually fit on. And I hope it will, because the GPU is sanging a bit already. And I think we might be good, you know? Yeah, look at that. Just a couple of thumb screws to go in, get those nice and tight. And then we can loosen off this little support bracket, get the card level. I think that's pretty good. And then, yeah, GPU power cable is next. Connect that up. Yeah, look at that. It's in, right. The, the one thing I do want to do though is turn this system on because I've been doing the RGB as I go and I have a feeling could look quite pretty. So here we go. Three, two, add some like suspenseful music. One. Uh-huh, okay. Those aren't on. The front ones are on, the back ones are on, the bottom ones are on. No display there and no display there. Okay, I think I need some time to get this thing fixed and I'll rejoin you for the benchmark shortly where I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the screens in this PC and how they work. Okay, so the build looks good. And I've been really impressed actually by what Thermal Take have done on their screens. Not only do the screens look great, as you've seen in the montage, but the software on your screen now is fairly intuitive, pretty easy to use, and definitely an improvement on some of the software suites they've had in the past. Now, in terms of performance, let's take a look. Obviously, we tested at 4K across the board. The only exception is Fortnite, where we always test at 1080p competitive. Everything else though, at that high preset. Starting off with a nice easy title, Apex Legends. You won't be surprised to hear that even at 4K high, this build still pulls in nearly that 300 FPS cap with 289.4 on average. Call of Duty's Black Ops 6 performs really well at 4K high, just shy of 108 frames per second. Cyberpunk pushes us into the region at 4K high of nearly 95 FPS, while the worst result of all the games today was actually Doom the Dark Ages. 4K high, this is a really, really tricky, really graphically intensive game to run, and here the system pulled in 62 FPS. It's perhaps the only time on the list where you may want to consider 1440p, which does feel a bit mad on a build of this budget, or of course using NVIDIA's multi-frame generation tech to insert some much needed fake frames into the equation, if you want to call them that. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.